Amen. You could be seated. I've anticipated for a really long time about doing a study on uh, Revelation, but one of the weird things is every time I think about that, I find some some new person that just started a series in Revelation, and I'm like, oh man, I, <laughs> I know that's wrong. Like you just got to preach what God gives you to, gives you to preach. But I there's so many different Revelation is one of those books. There's so many different people that have different opinions on the book, and and uh, there are lots of books written about that. Of all the books I have on my shelves, as far as commentary go, I don't I don't hardly use any of them, but that are on my library. Probably the biggest section is Revelation because there's so many books written on that and so many different opinions. And, and it seems like every time somebody starts a series, everybody's like, oh, man, I can't wait to tune into this one. And I remember one time we had a lady come into our church in Iola, and, uh, and all of a sudden she stopped coming for a little while. And next time we saw her, she was like, yeah, I'm sorry. Like, I, I want to come to your church, but the church down the street just started a series on Revelation. And I had to go... <laughs> Check out that series because I really want to know about Revelation. And anyway, it's almost like that thing that's like overdone. Like, hey, if you want to hear something about Revelation, there's a billion resources out there, you know, that you can go to. But really, I mean, there's only one real source you can go to. If you're wanting to study Revelation, you got to go to the Bible and study Revelation. So uh, we did first, second, third John, and I said, you know what? Let's just keep going. We'll do Jude. We did Jude, and I said, well, let's just keep going and do Revelation. <laughs> All right, so let's take a look at Revelation today. It's going to be a little bit of just an introduction to the book of Revelation. We'll see where, where we go from that. <clears throat> My heading says, and I know these aren't inspired, but the heading says, The Revelation of St. John the Divine. Who else says that? St. John the Divine. I don't even know what that means. That's actually how the 1611 uh, renders it, is, Saint, is uh, the Revelation of St. John the Divine. And so we've always heard it, the revelation of John, or, you know, he, John the Revelator, you know, and he had this vision and all this kind of stuff. But really, the first words in say, Jesus Christ. Okay, not say that's what the title ought to be, not Revelation. It says it that way. And I'll point something out here in a minute that also is in 1611. It's a little confusing. But we know that what is meant here is the fact that John's the one that's passing this message around. We understand that. He talks a little bit about himself and uh, how he's on this Isle of Patmos and all that. But let's break down this first description that the Bible gives us. Okay, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, not to John, to Jesus. God gave to Jesus this revelation to show unto his servants things that must shortly come to pass. And signified it by his angel unto his servant John. All right, there's a lot to, uh, uh, to unpack here. Okay, so he wrote this. He, he, it was delivered unto John, who was the servant, and then it was for the servants, okay? Man, there's a lot to, there's a lot to break down. So, number one is this, the revelation of Jesus Christ. I think everybody here knows what revelation means, right? It means to reveal something. I had a revelation. I, 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 I understood something that I didn't know before. So, the revelation is implying what? That there's something that is revealed. Now, how many of you guys have ever been told or you know somebody who has said, said uh, uh, don't read the book of Revelation, it's too hard? Somebody was telling me that they were taught that growing up. Don't read the book of Revelation. I've heard tons of people tell me that. I always had pastors tell me, don't read the book of Re Revelation, it's too hard. If anyone ever tells you not to read any book of the Bible, that's weird. <laughs> All right. But to me, it almost seems extra weird to say don't read Revelation whenever it says there's a blessing involved in in reading this book. And so uh, look at Daniel chapter 12, if you would. Daniel chapter 12. Way back in Daniel's day, he actually received a lot of the revelation that we read about in the book of Revelations. But he didn't, he didn't completely understand everything that he was seeing. And it really bothered him as he's thinking about not understanding this and, and uh, waiting for an interpretation of it. So look at Daniel chapter 12, 
Uh, look up verse 4. Let's see. Just Let's start reading it, verse 1. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth uh, for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that slept in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and the knowledge shall be increased. All right, look at verse 8. And I heard, but understood not. Then said I, O my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed to the time of the end. Now I've heard people say, Oh, the key to understanding Revelation is Daniel. Anybody ever heard that? The key to understanding Revelation is Daniel. And I would say that sounds kind of ridiculous considering Revelation is by definition, a revelation of that thing that was concealed in the book of Daniel. So actually, the key to understanding Daniel is revelation, right? Now, that might not mean a lot right now, but by the end of this uh, study in Revelation, I think that we'll get this. But what Daniel was showed right there is some really interesting stuff, all revealed later on in the New Testament. But everyone wants to go back to Daniel's time and say, oh, this is all about Daniel's people, the Jews, and this is talking about you know, the, uh, the time of Jacob's trouble, and this is all, and they're throwing out words out there about, uh, about Israel. Now, we were uh, knocking on one door here in uh, El Dorito Springs yesterday, and the, man, we talked to this guy. It was one of those doors I should have left a long time ago, but the conversation was good, and we kept talking and talking and talking. And, uh, and I was just getting ready to leave, and he was like, can I ask you something? He's like, what do you think about the... Uh, uh, the Messianic Jews. He didn't say that word, but he said the Jews that are like Christians or the Christians that are like Jews and all this kind of stuff. And he was asking me some questions about that. Not sure what the interest was. I did hear that there's something in town there. I think there's there's some kind of work in town that's, that's kind of a Messianic Jew thing. And so he, he was asking me about that. And I said, I said, I don't know which way he was going. I didn't know what he was trying to get out of me. But I just said, look, all I know is the Bible says in Christ, there's neither Jew nor Gentile. Okay. And he's like, that's what I believe, <laughs> right? And so I'm like, well, that's what we need to believe because that's what the Bible says. Amen. Now, why anybody would start trying to make everything in the New Testament to apply to go back to Jews whenever Jesus makes it so clear that, you know, this is now, you know, I, I, the, the, temp, the veil is torn in, in two, and, you know, hey, in the 70 A.D., I mean, he didn't say 70 A.D., but the time's coming when no stone is going to be left upon another and, and the temple's going to be destroyed and all that. All these were like, these were very uh, powerful statements that this, the nation of Israel, as they knew it, was no more, right? There's, it's, all, it's either Christ or you reject Christ, right? It's either uh, you uh, have the Father and you receive the Son or you don't have the Father or the Son, right? And so it's, it's is very, very, very clear. So it doesn't matter what your blood is. And you guys, I'm, I'm sure have heard this argument and, and understand this. But my whole life, man, it's all about the Jews. You got to bless the Jews, you know. And I said one time, I was like, man, do I get a special blessing if I like have, if I look at my genealogy and I got some kind of like percentage of Jewish blood? Am I going to get some kind of special blessing? Nobody can answer me. They're like, no, it doesn't work that way. Well, well, how does it work? <laughs> I mean, how does it work? Because if the blessings are on the Jews, what you know, what are we looking for? Is it because they're God's people? They can't be God's people. They reject Jesus. Yep. Is it because uh, of their blood? Well, most of those are white guys <laughs> from Europe, you know. And a lot of guys uh, that they would hate because they're Muslim have more of Abraham's blood than they do. And, and it's like none of those arguments make sense. So you say, okay, well, no, no, it's the religion. Really? The religion of the Jews? I mean, that's what, you're, that's what God's going to bless. So it's, re, it's ridiculous how people want to throw all this out, you know, everything that you read in Revelation and say, no, 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 no. Okay. 
I'm going to show you here in a minute that it would be ridiculous for the New Testament Christians to have this book. God says, I gave it to you. I want you to study it. I want you to read it. I want you to learn it. Oh, but it's not for you. <laughs> it's for the Jews who aren't even saved right now, but in the tribulation, they're going to be saved. And I guess they're going to pick up the book and start reading it or something and say, oh, this is for us. Right? I, this is ridiculous, but that's an interpretation. But here's what happens, and I talked about this a little bit uh, this morning in Iola. Here's what happens when, instead of reading God's Word, you read man's words about God's Word. It'll mess you up every time. You start reading that, and, uh, and people spend more time reading the commentaries. And I look, I've, I've been in the ministry for a while. I've known a lot of preachers. I've been to Bible college, and I can tell you, people start with the commentaries. Like, that's good homiletics. Right, you've got, no hermeneutics. That's the uh, you got to study the Bible, right? By looking all all these men's, you know, probably go back to rabbis, Jewish rabbis, right? Yeah, they're going to tell you you got to bless the you got to bless Israel. So anyway, you got to be real careful with just studying man's interpretations of the Bible. Uh, now I'm a, a preacher. I'm getting up here. I'm telling you what I see as I read this, but you read it for yourself and you think about these things for yourself. I could be wrong on some of this, but uh, but he says here the word revelation. Okay, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, Paul to have known some of these these truths. Look at Thessalonians, First Thessalonians. Actually, every chapter, interestingly enough, in First and Second Thessalonians is practically has something in it about the end times. Revelation 5 is one of the most popular ones. Re I mean, not Revelation. Thessal 1 Thessalonians 5 is one of the most popular ones. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord should come as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all children of light, and the children of the day are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they which be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul had some understanding of uh, some kind of understanding about what was going to happen in the end times. And doesn't that make sense? Because a lot of times he'll refer the people that he's, that he's writing to, and I understand that the Holy Spirit inspired all this, but he'll refer them back to the words of Jesus. Didn't Jesus teach you this? So look at Matthew chapter 24. And sure enough, Matthew 24, Jesus is going to talk about the end times. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the building of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall, be, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Now, don't you think that everything he's about to say is going to answer that question that they just asked? They said, what? Tell us about the end times. When is that time going to be? Uh, all these things, the end of the world, right? That's what they want to know. You know, our society today wants to know, when is the end of the world? lady walked out this morning she didn't know what i was preaching here in kansas city but she as she was out she's like are you ever going to preach on revelation <laughs> and i was like i am actually this afternoon i'm starting a series it's well if you just think about the things that are going on in this world right now i mean if you have heard uh full theorizing about things going on right now hey this is a sign this is the end time you're knocking on a door uh yesterday and the lady said i don't believe Bible necessarily. I just I have some kind of faith. There's some kind of afterlife and all this kind of thing. And then all of a sudden her husband comes out and I've had this happen so many times that I thought he was going to say, hey, you need to go, right? Because I kept talking to her and I thought, and he came out and he was like, 
I'm so glad you're here. I've been trying to talk to her for a long time. I'm a Christian. <laughs> so I kept talking to him, talk, talk to her. And, uh, anyway, we talked for a long time. And uh, eventually kind of things came to a close and it was kind of like, it's in your court now. You have to decide if you're going to believe that or not. And her, her husband comes out and he's like, can I just ask you one more question? And he's like, what do you think about the mark of the beast? And she's like, oh, no, I'm out of here. And she left. Like, apparently it's something he talks about all the time. And he's like, don't you know they're trying to put chips in people right now? And don't you know they're going to vaccinate everybody? And they're going to look, our society right now is seeing these things and they're saying, what is this? Is it, you know, what's going on in our world? And if they have any knowledge of the Bible, they say, man, some of these things seem to be coming to, you know, coming into place. I'm not saying like we are in the actual uh, last days in the sense of like, like we're seeing Revelation unfold. But can't you see uh, any that but it's a studied, studied prophecy at all, how these things are so fastly, just uh, so quickly just coming into, into play. And so, uh, so Jesus actually pointed out exactly what's going to happen. And so it makes sense then that if Jesus is giving John a revelation that he was given by God, that he probably is going to say the same thing that he told the disciples in Matthew 24, right? Also Mark 13, Luke 21. All right, so number one was just the revelation of Jesus Christ, okay? This is, this is a revelation. This is something that we should be able to understand. People are, oh, no, no, don't read Revelation. It's too hard to understand. Well, that's not what it's supposed. That's what it's. That's not what it's there for. It's there so that you will understand. And so people make it so mysterious and so hard to understand. But really, it is pretty consistent throughout the Bible. Whether you're talking about Daniel, the words of Paul, uh, the words of John right here, or Jesus Himself in the Olivet Discourse, uh, this is something that He revealed to us that He wants us to know. It's not. It's not some mysterious thing that's out there. And like a super, like a, uh, what do you call it, like a superstitious, just read the book of Revelation and you're going to get some kind of special blessing. No, you're going to get a special blessing because you're going to understand <laughs> what's going to happen in the last days. All right. So the second point is this, uh, the second part of that chapter. Look back at chapter one. Second part of that verse. The second part I want you to see is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Right now, this is going to mess up the whole oneness idea. <laughs> All right, God. So I guess I guess Jesus gave the revelation to Himself. Right? That seems kind of weird. No, we're talking about different verses. This is interesting. This whole verse is just hear me out. I'm going to show it to you in a second. But this whole verse here is the whole Trinity backing up this this witness of of the. God gave to him. Provided it by his angel. Now, are you saying that the angel is the Holy Spirit? No. But what is an angel? An angel is a messenger. Okay, now, if you read in the further later studies, we're going to talk about this, but. Uh, I, I believe probably the angel of the different churches is talking about the pastor. That's kind of what I think. But, the, but whatever the case, the, by angel right there, what it means is a messenger. Okay, so you think about evangelist, right? It's got that word angel in it, and, and that's a person who is delivering a message. He's an evangelist. And so the angel is somebody who is carrying the message. Now, the Holy Spirit, it doesn't matter who the messenger is, okay? If we go preach the gospel and we, you know, aren't right within our own lives, let's say we're, uh, uh, you know, fell into sin or whatever, but we go out and we preach the gospel, somebody can still get saved from that, right? Because the gospel is God's word. That's where the power is. All right. It's not so much that the person is messed up. It's, it's God's word. It has power. Okay. But the Holy Spirit is the one that brings men to the Lord whenever he's preached, whenever he's lifted up, right? Does that make sense, what I'm saying? So when the gospel is preached, when the message is delivered, in essence, the Holy Spirit is going to convict hearts whether or not they believe that message. They're going to have to, you know, reject the Holy Spirit or accept what the Holy Spirit's doing. All right, so, so in this case, uh, John is receiving this message, and look at verse 10. 
I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as a trumpet. Now, this is really interesting. Is, that, is Spirit capitalized or lowercase? Capital, is everybody, everybody's capitalized? Look at chapter 4. In verse 8. No, no, I don't know why I said 8. Uh, four, 4, verse 2. And immediately I was in the Spirit. Is that capitalized or it's lowercase? Lowercase. lowercase. And behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this. Uh, you know, I hope, I hope I'm not throwing anybody off here or confusing anybody, but I think both of those are the same. In, he's in the Spirit. Oh, well, no, there must be something significant because it's capitalized. Well, if you go back to the 1611, guess what? Both lowercase, right? Oh, is that some kind of error? Should we throw our 1769 out? No, the thing is, capitalization in the 1611, there was no legitimate rules on that. Okay? They used whatever they wanted to do. They capitalized it. Punctuation, no legitimate rules. And so you can't really throw out your Bible because there's some minor changes in capitalization, capitalization punctuation, all that kind of stuff. But if you look at 1611, both of those are lowercase. I don't know why they decided to capitalize one and, lower, and, and the other one's lowercase. You can make a guess somebody else. I don't know. But he's in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. And it, when he's in the Spirit, he's getting this revelation from uh, an angel, from a messenger. And this messenger is giving him the revelation of Jesus Christ. Okay, And so you got this, uh, which was given to him by... God the Father. Okay, so the whole Trinity there is uh, delivering this message and and uh, is a witness to that. Okay, the Spirit speaks when God's word is preached. <clears throat> As I already pointed out, Jesus had already preached some of these things in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. You see the accounts of that, but in this case, John is getting a special like like man. Anything that was unclear before, it's going to be clarified right now. And isn't it cool that it's the last book of the Bible? I mean, you know, you, got, you start in the very beginning of the Bible, and you see, in the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. I mean, that's, that's, you can't go back any farther than that. There's, nothing, there's nowhere you could go before that. And then you get to the very end of the Bible, and we're talking about the end times, things that haven't happened yet. And it's just God made sure that this book was just complete, you know, the complete Word of God. You can't add or take away from it. You can't add a a uh, book of Mormon on top of that and say, hey, it's the special revelation. It's another revelation. No, there's no such thing. This is the final revelation. Okay. So when God's word is preached, there's nothing, there's not some new revelation that the Spirit's going to give somebody. No, when the, when the word of God is preached, the Spirit is going to draw them into that by the preaching of the word. All right. And so, uh, so here we see the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him and signified it by the angels. And then also notice this, and go back to Revelation 1, verse 3. Or actually, I'm going to go to 3 in a minute, but back to 1, it says, And, uh, and he show to show unto his servants the things which must shortly come to pass. Now, he said, I'm going to show, to, this is for to show to my servants. Now, He's going to send this to the seven churches of Asia right there. He's going to, he's, all these things are going to be read. Now, the first part, you know, uh, we're going to get to this in later studies, but the first part is dealing with those churches individually. Yeah, I'm sorry they're not, like, talking about different ages. I don't believe that, okay? This is literal churches that were there, and he's saying, I want these messages to be delivered to these seven churches. Now, the seven churches are going to get those, and then uh, they're also going to read everything after that. So the first part is going to deal with their church specifically, and everything after that is just for all of them, cumulatively. Okay? We today are the servants of God. We receive this message. It's for us. Okay? And so that we're the, uh, the servants of God. And so here's what God says in this word. Right? He gave the revelation to Jesus. Jesus gave it to John through, the, through an angel, and uh, John is giving it to the servants of God. And he said this, verse 3, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Now, again, it's not a good luck charm where somebody says, well, 
you know, I just got to read the re book of Revelation today and God's going to impart some kind of special blessing. No, that's not what he says. He says, blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. You're not actually going to get some special blessing just because you read Revelation. But you're going to get a special blessing when you read it, you hear what's being said, and you apply it to yourself, and you do the things that it's saying, right? Now, if it doesn't apply to us, how could we get any kind of blessing out of it? <laughs> if the things that are happening there you know, don't relate to us, uh, then how can we get a blessing? So, Matthew 20, well, let me see here. So, what about these servants? Here's an interesting thing. Again, my whole life, here's what I've been taught. Because really, you could ask somebody, so where do you see pre-trib rapture in the book of Revelation? Anybody know where they'll take you? I mean, anybody ever asked that question to someone who believes pre-trib? Chapter 4, let's go there. And after this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were a trumpet talking with me, which, saith, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which shall be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Did you see the rapture? <laughs> you didn't see the rapture? Let's read it again. No, I was just kidding. So they'll say, well, see right there, he went up in the spirit to heaven, and so there's the rapture. And if you say that doesn't even make sense, here's what they'll say. Well, you won't find the church anywhere after that verse. And that's why we know that this is, you won't find church anywhere after. Now, here's the, here's the weirdest thing about that argument. My whole life, I've slipped and said, now, it depends. Different people have different ideas within the independent fundamental uh, movement, but I've heard people say, if I say, you know, you know, well, God just died for the church, you know, well, he loves the church, and, and if I say church in, in the sense of somebody who's outside this church, right, people will say, what are you, a uh, universalist? <laughs> you believe in the church? There is no the church. There are churches. There's this church, and there's that church. Local churches, which I agree. I agree with that, okay? Sometimes I use that terminology about the church, and I get kind of messed up. But the weird thing about the argument is those same people will say, you don't see the church after this verse. The church is raptured. Wait, wait, wait. Does God rapture the church or does he rapture churches? Well, yeah, yeah. Well, he raptured. He raptured it's the rapture of the saints. Okay. Well, okay. So do we find any saints in <laughs> the Bible after that verse? We most certainly do. We find servants, don't we? The Bible uses the word servants quite a bit in the book of Revelation. Look at 1, uh, one, one we already talked about. He's writing uh, to the servants. Uh, chapter 2, verse 20. Thou suffers that woman Jezebel, which called herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce servants. Those are other people that were in the church, right? Not Jezebel. She's... Jezebel's in the church stirring up problems, causing his servants, talking about believers in that church, right, to go into fornication. And so he uses the word servant there. Chapter 7, verse 3. Saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. I'm going to have to get into that in future lessons. I can't explain it right now. But you see the word servant being used. Chapter 11, verse 18. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come in the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. Again, I'll explain that later. I'm just showing you that the word servant is used. Chapter 19, verse 2. For true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. It's consistently using servants, just talking about the people of God. All right? Chapter 20, 
2, verse 6. And he said unto me, The sayings are faithful and true, and the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. So now he's just concluding this by saying the same thing he said at the very beginning. Not only that, look at chapter 6. Chapter 6, verse 9. doesn't say the word servant, but here's what it says. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Now, you, you, we're going to see in, in upcoming lessons, you study this out, it's talking about people who are dying in the tribulation. Okay, I thought we were gone before the tribulation. That's because somebody read to you the works of Schofield <laughs> or the works of Darby. or the, They weren't reading it to you from the Bible. All right. They said, no, you've got to rightly divide. Well, who decides how to rightly divide? Well, Schofield does. <laughs> I mean, I guess that's what they think. Because you won't find that in the Bible. You see, oh, no, the church isn't there. Wait, wait, God raptured what? The servants of God. He raptured the elect. He raptured the saints. All those people are still there. They're being persecuted. All right. The reason the church is mentioned is because he's not talking about the seven churches anymore. He's talking about oh, as a whole, all these people. Uh, Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. Again, this is Jesus talking about the things that are going to happen in the end. And here's what he says. Look at verse 24. So Matthew 24, verse 24. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the sun, uh, the coming of the sun of man be. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will be the eagles. Uh, there will the eagles be gathered together. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun shall be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the power of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and glory. Let's uh, keep reading one more verse. And he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now, again, we'll, we'll talk about all this later. But the Bible makes it very clear that there are some of his elect on the earth during the tribulation. There are servants who are being persecuted for their testimony of the, war, of the, of the Lord. And so, I think a lot of people here probably already uh, uh, understand that to some degree, but Christ, he said that God would give to him, sanctified by his angel. Uh, number three was to show unto his servants Okay, that would include us, I believe. And number four is this. He said, things that must shortly come to pass. Things which must shortly come to pass. Now, has anyone ever been thrown off by that? I, I was tripped up by that for a long time. And let me just tell you that concept. Now, look, if you're going to read, nobody said it's an easy book to read. That is an easy book to understand. It's just the fact that it is a revelation and it will tell you uh, the facts but you have to read it. It's going to take some work, okay? All right, but if you read this and you look and it says, things that must shortly come to pass. Behold, I come quickly. I mean, all these things make it sound like the after Jesus, you know, went to heaven, he's like, hey, I'm coming back quickly. You know, just keep watching for me in the sky. And, and so as John is writing this, it's like, man, he's coming any moment. We know how many years ago that was. I mean, we're talking about, I don't know when John uh, wrote the book of Revelation exactly, but uh, some say it was after 70 A.D. I don't think so. I think it was before 70 A.D., but it's around that. Uh, it's, it's later on into that time. But it's nothing. I mean, I mean, so much time has gone by since then. We're in the year 2020, and the Lord hasn't come back. So you know what a lot of people will say is they'll say, well, that's because 
this doesn't have anything to do with the future time. They'll either say that Jesus came, I mean, I mean, Jesus was talking about all this prophecy is talking about the events that happened in 70 AD when the Romans came in and they destroyed the temple and all that kind of stuff. Anybody ever heard that point of view? Okay, this is the idea. Some will uh, have just various ideas, but typically there's an amillennial idea, okay, which means basically we're in the millennium, either it's symbolic or, you know, it already happened in 70 AD and all, all the events in Revelation are just kind of symbolism of what's going to happen in the church age. And uh, there's all kinds of different, uh, different things out there. So you might ask yourself, well, yeah, what about that? It's been a long time. Right. And Jesus hadn't come back. These events haven't taken place that we can see. Right. Well, let's read what the Bible says. Second Peter, chapter three. Now, first of all. In a manner of speaking, the time, ha the time will be short. You know, whenever it happens, we are in the last days. I believe anybody believe that. So here's how I look at that. When Jesus came the last time or the end times, right? I feel like that signifies that it's going to be less time, you know, after Christ, it's going to be less time between that and the end times than it was at the time of Christ from creation. Does that make sense? So therefore, we're in the end times. We're in the last days, right? These were the first days. Now, these are the last days. That's my thinking, all right? I, you could, you could, admit, you, you could uh, say that I'm wrong on that. That's fine. But here's what I'll show you, 2 Second, Second Peter chapter 3. Sorry, I thought I was there. 2 Peter chapter 3, look at verse 3. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lust, and saying, Where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Doesn't it sound to you like the Holy Spirit wants you to know that people are going to at some point in history say, oh, where is he? You know, where is he? That if, supposed to be, if he's supposed to already be here, where is he? Okay, but here's what the Bible says. For this they willingly are ignorant of. That by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Now, people, again, will take that and say, see, so you got to, you got to rightly divide here. And when it says a thousand days, well, you got to take every day. Every day equals a thousand years. And equal, it's not what he said. <laughs> He's just saying in God's economy of time, one day, thousand years doesn't really matter. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's all the same. It's not, it's not relevant. Okay, so what we need to do as Christians, and this is the point of saying, hey, I come quickly. I come shortly. It's not like he was lying or deceiving us because in, in, in a sense it is shortly. But here's what he wants you to do. He wants every Christian to live their life as though, man, he could come. Yep. It could, this all could come to play at any moment, right? Now, I'm not talking about, hey, things are getting really rough. He could come at any moment. Just snatch us out of here. We won't have to worry about the, the hardships of this world any longer. And I'm looking at my cush life, <laughs> the easy life I live right now, the minute persecution. Oh, I got an email. Somebody called me a bad name. I'm, I'm suffering so hard for Jesus. No, 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 no. <laughs> Let's read it. You know, Th 2 Thessalonians. Hey, it sh shouldn't surprise you when things get rough. Shouldn't surprise you when people start threatening to put ch ch chips in your hand and <laughs> vaccinate you and make you wear masks. No, that's just my thing. <laughs> it shouldn't surprise you whenever they say, hey, we're going to, we're thinking about a cashless society shouldn't surprise you. You know these things are going to happen. In fact, he says what? There's going to be wars. There's going to be rumors of wars. There are going to be earthquakes in diverse places. There's going to be all these terrible things. But he says, ah, that's only the beginning of sorrows. <laughs> it's going to, aren't you encouraged this morning? Aren't you glad? <laughs> aren't you? Anna, I'm just trying to be a blessing. Hey, look, that's only the beginning. We haven't even experienced any of it yet. Yeah, but you know what? But we live every moment. When things get rough, we're not there yet. Okay. We really, we're really not. But when things get rough, 
We live every moment thinking, hey, he's coming back. Amen. He's coming back. And everyone else is like, what are you talking about? You're so stupid. You really believe that Bible? Even the Christians saying, what are you talking about? You know, he already came a long time ago <laughs> because they get messed up on the doctrine. But if you read the book of Revelation and you understand it, it's going to be a comfort to you. It's going to be a blessing to you because you're going to say, hey, even though these things are getting rough, if I endure to the end, oh, no, we're not talking about work salvation. If I endure to the end of this tribulation that's coming, guess what? I'm going to be saved from it. If I die before that, praise the Lord, I'm going to heaven anyway. But if I have to endure some of the tribulation that's coming in this, which we'll talk about in the upcoming uh, lessons, I don't have to worry about it. I am not appointed unto wrath. Now, people will say, oh, you're not appointed unto wrath. Well, you're not going to go through the tribulation. They aren't reading the book of Revelation very clearly because there's a big difference between tribulation and God pouring out his wrath. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And so we're going to see that in the upcoming chapters. But the revelation that God gave us is something that he wants us to know and something that will bless us. It can bless us and it will bless us if we actually read it and we hear it and we uh, apply it to our, to our lives and uh, we do the things that are in this book. Okay, so if you're saved, I think hopefully everybody in here is saved. If you're saved, you know you're going to heaven. Hopefully you're interested. Hey, when's, when's he coming back? <laughs> you know, when's he coming back to get me? I don't have a problem with all my friends who think I'm nuts for not believing in a pre-trib rapture, and they're just like, hey, I could, he could come any moment. Well, I sure hope he does. <laughs> you know, that's not what I read when I read the Bible. I read that, hey, things are going to get a lot worse than this before he comes. But you know what? If they're right, praise the Lord. You know, but Christians ought to be saying, I want to know, when is he coming? What should I look for? Well, no man knows the day and the hour. I don't need to know the day and hour. I just want to know what the events are going to look like as he starts getting closer so that when I see them coming, I won't be surprised. Hey, that's what he said. You won't be surprised. He won't come to you as a thief in the night because you are already expecting him to come, right? This is why the book of Revelation can be such a blessing to you. So being messed up on the book of Revelation isn't necessarily leading anyone. It's, it's not leading anyone to damnable heresy because they don't have the timing of the rapture right. It's not leading anyone to damnable heresy because, you know, they misinterpret some of these things or whatever. But it is important. God wanted us to understand what's going to happen in the end time so much that he gave a vision to Daniel. He revealed that later on through uh, Jesus himself. Paul referred back to the words of Jesus and referred to those same things that were going to happen and said, hey, you shouldn't be surprised. The Lord taught you this. And then John, the last book of the Bible, gets a very detailed vision. <laughs> Not just that, I'm going to show you. He gives it to him twice. <laughs> okay, Because I believe once you get to chapter 12, he gives it to him all over again in kind of a different perspective of it. And so there's no reason for us to be like just totally in the dark about what's going to happen. But unfortunately, the world is in the dark on what is going to happen in the, in the end times. And you know why? Because they're, just, they're not studying the Bible. They're not studying what God says. They're just listening to what man says. We went on vacation one time, and how many of you guys have had to go to, on vacation? Hey, we've got to find a church to go to. We always try to go to church when we're on vacation. And, and it was like, a, uh, I, think, I think it was actually a Sunday. Was it a Sunday? It's a Sunday night, and we were like, hey, we you know, we got to find a church, so we're calling around. Found a church that looked like a good church. Hey, King James only? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. I mean, they were just trying anything they could to get us to come, you know, whatever. It's like, well, what do you want us to be? <laughs> it wasn't that bad. but uh, And so we finally said, all right, I think this is the best we're going to get. Let's just go check it out. And we went there, and uh, the first thing they did is they sent us into a Sunday school class. Hey, I think you'll be most comfortable in this class over there. So we went in and started. It's like, Sunday school should have already been going, but the teacher's not there. And eventually people start wondering, like, where's the teacher? Where's the teacher? And, and so they start looking around at each other thinking, uh, well, who's going to teach? Should we go over to the other class? No, no, surely one of us can teach a Sunday school lesson. How about Miss So-and-so? You know, she, she's a good teacher. And, and I was like, I was about to say, hey, I'll teach it because <laughs> they probably would have let me teach it. <laughs> and uh, so my wife and I were just kind of like, I hope the woman doesn't get up to teach. And, and, uh, and uh, <laughs> all of a sudden this guy said, yeah, you know what, I'll do it. I'll just pick something simple. How about the book of Revelation? <laughs> I was like, hey, man, this is going to be fun. And all he did, he didn't hardly even open the scripture. He just like, 
you know, things, and this was years ago. This is this is before COVID-19. <laughs> years ago, and he's saying, he's saying, uh, oh, you know, you know, you just look at the world right now, and you just know that Antichrist is coming. Not even open in the Bible. He's just like, Antichrist coming. He's going to give you the market. I was reading in this one, this one article was talking about the chips and all this kind of stuff, and he's just throwing all these, like, conspiracy theories out, stuff that he had read, stuff that he had heard other preachers say. Didn't really care about what the Bible said. And unfortunately, there are preachers today that will get to preach the book of Revelation, and that's exactly what they do. Well, this is what I was taught. This is what this commentary says. This is what, well, just read it for yourself. <laughs> I literally, uh, okay, so you guys know that this is the one area that caused me to kind of lose some of my Baptist friends. They're like, whoa, 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 you believe, you don't believe in the pre tribulation rapture? I don't, I don't think I could fellowship with you. <laughs> I mean, it was like really, it was a big deal. And I tried to tell them, hey, it's not that big of a deal. If I can explain to you what I believe, maybe, you, maybe you'll understand. And, and I, and I kind of went into uh, to all this. And Oh, where was I going with this? I got distracted. Help me out. Okay, so, uh, <laughs> huh? So, okay, so this, this, this teaching this caused me to lose some friends. I don't maybe I wasn't meant to say it because I just I lost it. Come on. My wife can read my mind usually. <laughs> All right. Uh, let me think here. I was talking about the fact that they, re oh, huh? Yeah. Man, I don't remember where I was going. Maybe it'll come back to me in a second. But uh, but I do know this, that somebody called me and they, and they were saying, look, hey, man, I'm, this is just what I believed, you know, all my life. And, you know, nobody's going to convince me otherwise and all that kind of stuff. I'm too old to learn something new or whatever. And I'm like, Man, just you just you just read it for yourself. Oh, I know what I was gonna say. Oh, so <clears throat> I started like asking around and and trying to find out some things, and I'm thinking how, like how did I actually come to to view this? Because here here's what all my friends thought, thought. He started listening to Pastor Anderson, and he just believed what Pastor Anderson had to say about the rapture. He'll follow him. He'll do anything that he says to do. And actually, that's not how it went. And so I began to research back, and I said, you know, I remember reading this in Bible college, and they gave me a book, okay? I went into eschatology, just a big fancy word, study of end times, okay? Went to my eschatology class. You had to buy all these really expensive books, and you buy this book, and, and I'm like, oh, great, I'm going to learn about the end times. And I open up this book, and the entire book is like vocabulary words. And you have to learn what all these words mean, and uh, the different dispensations and the different, uh, it wasn't like a hardcore dispensational, but I'm just saying it's just teaching what all these words meant. It's the whole thing like this big encyclopedia. And I'm reading that, and I'm like, I don't know what these mean. I don't even really care. Like, how do I know that's true? You know, and people are like, oh, you don't understand Revelation? Here, you need to look at this chart. And I'm looking at this chart, and I'm thinking, okay, I see a few verses down there, but I don't really see where they're matching up the chart, and I, I don't get it. And I'm, I just, I don't get it. Somebody explain it to me. And instead of anybody just showing me from the Bible, it's like, oh, well, you got to read this. Oh, you got to, you got to get this book. Oh, you got to, and I'm thinking, no, I just want to see it in the Bible for myself. And so then I remember reading, I'm just reading it, trying to figure it out. And I'm like, man, it looks to me like we're going through some of these things that they said we're not going to go through. And, and, uh, and I'm just, I'm just trying to think this through. And then I'm on a bus ministry and I've got, I'm the bus driver, and I've got some guys working for me out at, at, at Southwest. We, got, we had a pretty big bus ministry there. And, uh, and the, one of the guys on there told me, he, was, he actually graduated, and he said, uh, they are allowing me to graduate. I kind of overheard something, and I was like, what happened? They're allowing me to graduate, but I can't walk across the platform because I wouldn't sign something saying that I believed in the pre-trib rapture. I'm thinking, as a young guy who doesn't know anything about the in times, except for everyone tells me, oh, you got to be pre-trib, you got to be pre-trib. And the fact that they're saying, we're not going to let him walk across the platform, this guy must be a heretic. <laughs> but then he started talking about, like, what it is that he believes. And I was like, that's, you just quoted scripture. I mean, that's what the scripture says. And he's like, yeah, yeah, but they, that's not the way, that's not the way they see it. So I kind of kept that in the back of my mind. So, so years later, uh, this is after Pastor Anderson and watching his Revelation series and stuff like that. And, uh, and obviously studying for myself. But afterwards, I, I tried to contact that guy. I couldn't get a hold of that guy, but I got a hold of his father. And his father said, uh, he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, my son d didn't believe in pre-trib rapture. He believed in more of a, more of a mid-trib was the word that he used. And I said, well, how did he come to that opinion? And he said, okay, and we were 
our, our pastor at that time was going through a Bible study. And we were all going through the Bible study, and he said, one week he came in and he said, you know what? I was studying this, and he said, and I'm reading through the Bible, and I'm reading it. And I, and I was getting ready to preach a message. He said, but I just couldn't preach it because I'm looking at it and said, that's not right. And he said, all of a sudden, he said, because I was reading my Bible, studying my Bible, I came to a different conclusion than I've been teaching. And so he went back and explained a different point of view, which was more like what I believe, actually, to this day. Because he read the Bible and he said, whoa, what they're teaching me is not right. And so that guy said, wow, he's right. And he convinced him. And he looked it in the Bible and he saw that and he said, hey, I believe that's right. And sure enough, Everybody's like, oh, no, he believes some kind of weird thing. Well, man, just look at it in the Bible. <laughs> it's going to tell you. Okay, so one, just last thing. I'm, I'm, I'm done here. Uh, this was just an introduction to what's going on, but why is that so important? Why, why do we need to know that we're going to go through tribulation? I'll tell you why. Because we live in a society where Christians think everything ought to be just super easy, that if they're blessed, that means they got lots of money, and lots of comfort, and uh, if a church is blessed, that means they got lots of people in there, and they got lots of finances, and buildings paid for, and all this kind of stuff, that these are the blessings of God. And if anybody ever uh, started losing any of that, they would say, oh, we're not blessed of God. And people live their life trying to seek comfort, trying to seek just, you know, hey, I, I just want to be as comfort comf comfortable as I can. I don't want to make any enemies. I don't want to lose any friends. You know, I just want to be comfortable. Well, when you study the book of Revelation, what you find is, hey, enjoy that comfort while you have it because it's not going to last very long. When we get to this, the first tribulation part that we'll real quickly come to in this study, when we get to those days, you're going to be tempted. You're going to be tested. You're going to be, I mean, they're going to be seeking for your life. You know, I, I couldn't help. I'm not saying that the COVID-19 thing was like the, the first you know, seal of the, <laughs> of, the, of the book or something. I'm not saying that, but what I'm saying is when I saw, and this is not me judging churches that did this, but when I saw so many churches just shutting down because the government was saying, oh, pestilence, 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 my mind's thinking the Bible says in the end times there's going to be pestilence. Oh, no, the government wants to shut us down. We, we got to obey our government. Well, in the end times, the government's going to, be searching, <laughs> seeking out Christians. And, uh, and, and if you read, I mean, the war, you know, oh, no, we got we to gotta bless Israel so that we won't be at war. I mean, <laughs> this, this is the mindset of, of a lot, most of the people I know that are pre-trib. It's like, oh, no, no, because we don't want war. We don't want trial. We got to make sure the right guy's president. We got to make sure, you know, we're blessing the right people and, and rubbing Buddha's head or something. <laughs> It's like what it feels like, you know, because they're just trusting in all these kinds of things. And they're saying, no, we got to have peace. We got to have, look, you're not going to have it. Yep. If you're following the Lord, you're not going to have it. So when things really get rough, because they haven't got rough yet, they really haven't. When things really get rough, are you still going to go soul winning? When things really get rough, are you still going to assemble? What if it's illegal to assemble? No church can ever you say that's not going to happen. <laughs> I bet you it's going to happen. Probably sooner than you know it. What a church is going to do? Well, guys, that's it. You know, it was a good run. <laughs> we, can't, we can't assemble anymore. Government said we're done. No, we're going to be assembling. Amen. I don't care if we got to hide out in the woods somewhere, <laughs> but we're going to be assembling. Amen. All right? Because we know things are going to get rough. We expect a fight. I'm not asking for a fight. I'm not trying to be... Uh, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be a rebel, trying to start a fight or anything like that. But we know the fight is coming. Now, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. I'm not going to, you know, worry about defending my, you know, property and all that kind of stuff. No, uh, but I am going to keep trying to do the work. I'm going to keep trying to preach the gospel. I'm going to keep trying to meet with believers. I'm going to keep reading my Bible. I'm gonna, and if the thing gets really, really rough, like three and a half years rough, <laughs> I'm looking up to heaven thinking he's coming any moment <laughs> because... That's what he said is going to happen. What a great comfort. You say, that's not comfort. I don't, want to, I don't want tribulation. Well, tell that to China, Christians in China, that are already running the risk of getting their heads cut off if they assemble. Right? We don't know persecution right now in America. And that's why so many churches are watered down. 
They're weak. They don't want to preach any doctrine. They don't want to do anything. They don't want to offend anybody. They certainly don't want to, uh, you know, go against the government when it comes to, you know, uh, well, I can't knock on that door, the government said, you know, and all this kind of stuff. But look, things are going to get rough. Things are going to get illegal, and oh, we might have to break a law because we got to uh, obey God rather than man. That's right. Now, I'm not into breaking laws. I'm really not. Seatbelt on occasion, most of the time. <laughs> but it's not like I just love breaking laws, okay? But we got to obey God rather than man. And you think I'm going to stop assembling? You think I'm going to stop witnessing? You think I'm going to stop doing any of these things just because times are getting rough? No, I get excited because I'm like, woo, it's going to get worse than this. <laughs> but when you see it happening, you're going to see fire underneath the Christians that are really fervent for the Lord. And you're going to see greater things happen than have ever happened before, I believe, for the cause of Christ. You're going to see soul winners going out soul winning. People getting saved because they're like, what's going on? You know, I heard about this uh, end times thing and these, and these uh, mark of the beast and all that stuff. And they're going to be curious and there's going to be some dedicated Christians that are like, hey, let me show you how you can know for sure you, you're going to live forever <laughs> with Jesus Christ. So let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Certainly, you haven't made everything in the Bible easy for us to understand. Uh, take a lifelong of, of dedication um, and, and still not know, ha, not have all the answers. But Lord, you sure have revealed a lot to us from your, your Bible. And I pray that you'll help us to take to heart those things that we read and those things that we hear and, uh, and that we would do the things that you've asked us to do. And Lord, we look up and we watch and we wait for these things to happen. Help us be bold. Help us have wisdom and to take the right steps that we might be most effective for doing your work. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.